Divine Service, setting 1, page 151. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father.
The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany is from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I, that is Isaiah, said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come to his host. Our epistle continues from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Simon, 
put out into the deep, and let your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come up and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. So also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
Jesus clearly, and as we sing, the light to reveal him to the Gentiles and the glory of his chosen Israel. Our sermon title today poses the question, what is the greater miracle? Catching the fish or catching of men? And it is our attempt to move our focus away from the catching of fish to the yet more wondrous and greater miracle that happened, that is the faith that transforms St. Peter, making him a fisher of men. Our pericope, or simply the lesson of the day, takes us through a reading from a well-known text from the prophet Isaiah. Certainly you may have made the connection between the Old Testament reading and the Gospel. So we will explore it together. The first is in the similarity of the reactions of the great seer Isaiah and St. Peter, the former, that is a prophet, seeing the Lord God high and lifted up, is filled with terror, with fear. And Isaiah's experience is an integral part of every Sunday divine service, and we call it the Sanctus, or the Holy, Holy, Holy. That is a part of our divine service every Sunday. And the next part of the prophet's word are also well remembered and often repeated by all of us. And it goes like this, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see a similar reaction from St. Peter as he understands that the man seated in his boat is the same Lord that Isaiah encountered in the year that King Isaiah died. And it is written, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. However, as we mentioned, the similarities between the two texts, the Old Testament and the Gospel, do not end there. In Isaiah, we see the Lord Almighty commissions Isaiah to be a prophet to the man. And we also see the purpose of teaching of Jesus, the focus of the Gospel lesson, is to show us how St. Peter and the disciples are brought into the Lord's service, transformed from being mere fishermen to being fishers of men. Thus, the greater miracle, as we said, is the miracle of the calling of the first disciples who were brought to faith by Jesus' words. And their faith was formed when our Savior's word made their journey from the ear to the heart and from the heart to the lip, and the lips then formed the words of confession agreed to the absolute sinfulness and exemplified best in the words of St. Peter. But we know our Lord is a merciful God, and so he pours out grace to all those who hear his word. And then, of course, by his word, Jesus is revealed as the answer to our sinful condition. He remains the answer to everyone's corrupted nature whose wages are death, from which we cannot escape, try as we may, vaccinated, unvaccinated, hesitant, not hesitant, unless we come to Jesus Christ, the only Savior. While the Lord speaks openly to all the people, for many it becomes a matter of losing the forest for the trees. Thus, some of the people see the miraculous catch of fish and they obscure the teaching of Jesus, as if that doesn't matter. Last Sunday we were talking about the authority of Jesus, and here we see an authoritative preaching of our Lord, which is infinitely greater than the two boatloads of fish, or even any other miracle, whether it be the feeding of the 5,000 and then the 4,000 raising from the dead. All of those are there, but they are not the focus of Christianity. However, in the case of the blessed apostle Peter, 
The taught word of Jesus lingered on in the background until it was brought into the foreground, into prominence by the stupendous catch of fish, as if the Lord was trying to get his disciples to focus on his teaching, that there was someone greater than Moses, there was someone greater than Isaiah, and there was someone even greater than the temple, because he, in whose name the temple was built, was here, that we may listen to him alone, as the voice of the Father says by the Mount of Transfiguration, for He, Jesus, is Lord. And Jesus explains, this catch is nothing compared to what lies in store for you. Soon you will be fishers of men. You see, what's happening with St. Peter is he sees creation respond to the Creator. The fish merrily swim into the nets at the wrong time of the day. As a fisherman, he knew when to fish and when not to. Not Jesus. Jesus was, after all, a carpenter by trade. However, by faith, the first apostle had his epiphany moment. It is impossible to arrive at any other deduction apart from that Jesus is indeed the true Son of God, their long-awaited Messiah. The words that Jesus was teaching now laid their firm foundation in the good soil. You see, his holy word causes all mankind to respond to their creator. They must all swim into his net. So the greater miracle is that faith is created by the words of the Savior. His word alone saves. The seed has already sprouted into a harvest. The words of eternal life authored by Jesus, bearing fruit in St. Peter, and soon from the blessed Peter into the world. And it continues unto the end of times, from Holy Mother Church, through all of you, into the world. Now for the disciples, admittedly, it appears that their long wait has come to an end. And you would expect euphoria from the disciples, and yet their reaction is not one of joy, but one of fear, a godly fear. This kind of fear that must descend upon us at the mere mention of the Lord. And in the case of the apostle, he was beholding his Lord face to face. Remember Isaiah's woeful cries as he beholds the Holy God? For in the light of God's holiness, our own sinfulness is known. And in our sinfulness comes a confession of sins. While Isaiah's iniquity is cleansed with a burning coal, for St. Peter, our Lord the Christ encourages and says, Do not be afraid. I am he. God shows us that he's come to us in peace to bind us, to remove our iniquity. Now, we all know that Jesus does the heavy lifting. Now, what are we supposed to do? The work of salvation is completed. What are we supposed to do? Well, the simple answer, do the Jesus talk. Not with the aim of converting. That is not something you can accomplish. Not your clever arguments not the experience of your life, not all the miracles that the Lord has already done in your life. No. Leave the convicting and the converting to the Holy Spirit. The generation before Jesus yearned to see the Lord, as in Matthew writes in the 13th chapter, he says, many longed to see what you see. Many longed to hear what you hear. And here we add, Many longed to be the ones to proclaim the gospel. And this is your whole life's aim. The other things you make out to be too important, your life, your job, your hobby, your me time, all of those must be placed on a lower pedestal. They will always be a step down from the proclamation of the gospel. For without it, no one may be saved. Without it, you were not saved. And so, walk in the ways of God. 
talk about your your redeemer your elder brother the only begotten son of god who died for you and for your sins my sins the darling of the angels and it isn't wonderful that even the angels are not tasked with proclaiming the gospel of forgiveness ordinary men and women like you and i the royal priesthood of all believers are given this task and as i said if there is no proclamation neither could saint peter have become a fisher of men and nor can you but we must clarify this is our chief task to proclaim the savior's work that alone saves from sins all our other tasks our professions our vocations all of them are subservient to the love of god which propels us to the proclamation of the gospel in the service of God and in love for our neighbor. You see, we are called to be Christians first, the sons of the Father, the children of the light, the daughters of Zion. That is our first calling. And often we become hesitant in sharing our faith with those outside of the faith. We want to keep Jesus to ourselves, like the people at Capernaum. But they're not the only ones we ignore, those outside of the faith. In the busyness of our life, we are nonchalant, even careless about our loved ones who are struggling without Jesus, our children, our spouse, our relatives, our best friends, way back from high school. We all know someone. We all know many of our beloved who have fallen away from practicing their faith. How will the people know if no one tells them? How will they remember what was taught to them from their childhood? Once again, it is not our job to convict or convert. It is to proclaim the gospel. Admittedly, we are all unequal to the task of the proclamation. But then again, the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance the words we can use. And I offer to you a tool that you know intimately. It is the Apostles' Creed as a framework for evangelism. It brings order to your proclamation since in it, it begins with the confession that God is Father. It confesses God the Son who died for us and our sins. It confesses the Holy Ghost who calls us by the Gospel, creates the one holy Catholic and apostolic church and through his body, the church. Christ daily forgives my sins and the sins of all believers. So we are a congregation founded on apostolic witness, and although we implore the Lord to depart from us poor, miserable sinners, thanks be to God, Jesus does not depart. Rather, he assures us that there is no reason to be fearful now there is no need for a burning coal. The Lord has taken away our iniquity through his own holy body, sacrificed on the cross, his holy blood shed for us, the same body of Christ that was crucified, the same blood that was separated at the crucifixion, now comes together inside you in humble elements. The Lord comes to live inside you, make intercession to heal, Come, says Jesus, do not be afraid. It is I in these humble elements. Eat and drink, be forgiven, be healed, be strengthened for your chief vocation that you may all become fishers of men. In the holy name of Jesus, amen.
us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, especially remembering Colleen's newborn son, who is in an ICU at this time, is a premature baby, uh, but uh, is progressing fine. Let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the wisdom and knowledge and every manifestation of the Holy Spirit, that our words may be measured and intelligible to our fellow Christians and those outside the church, and our amens uttered always in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, especially those called to be fishers of men and that they would not be discouraged when they toil all night and take nothing, but continue to let down their nets at his word according to that calling. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we may be mature in our thinking and infants in evil. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all Christian homes, that the word of God would be sown and produce much fruit. For the gift of marriage and family, to the parents to whom the care of children has been given, especially grant your healing to Colleen's a newborn son, and all expecting mothers and all those with infants be kept safe. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For faith to let down the nets of the Lord's word in our daily vocations, trusting his Son will do his gracious work through poor sinners like us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, the weak, and the afflicted, especially Colin, Linda, Patrick, Rosie, Jordan, and Jose, Kim, Jim, Paul, Ivan, and Uji, Nora, Julia, Nathan, Robert and Helen, Marilyn and the family, Elkin, Africa, Adam, Liv, Liz, Herb, Judy, Pastor Joseph Ivan, Annie, Renata, Les, Lynn, Joanne and Bruce, Emma, Etana, Renata, Jack and Shirley, Mitch, Pastor James Lou, Richard, Beth's mother Lee and Aunt Alice, Sonia, Ruth, David, Gail, Carr, Rose, Baby Angelina, Lily, Dawn, and all those we name in the silence of our hearts now. That God would not be far from us nor forsake us, but make haste to help us for Christ's sake. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all who commune, that our lips and lives would be cleansed by Christ's body and blood, that all would be worthy to stand before him now and at the last day, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. O Lord, never depart from us. Though we are unworthy of you and your bounty, you are pleased to receive our meager thanks and reluctant obedience for the sake of the perfect obedience of Jesus. Let your word rule us and your spirit revive us to leave behind pride and anxiety alike, that we may follow you in all we do. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. 